This is an audio reading of A Visit from Auntie Tressa Claus, William Hovey Smith, 2012. Well, of course, that's me. And let me introduce the characters. Now, this is James J., his wife, June, and their children, Jennifer and Jimmy J. A Visit from Auntie Tressa Claus, or the J. Family Christmas. Copyrighted 2009, William Hovey Smith, All Rights Reserved. Some years ago, there was a family named Jay who lived in Johnson City in the United States. James Jay was the father, June Jay the mother, Jimmy Jay the son, and Jennifer Jay the daughter. As Christmas approached, there was rising excitement as to what Santa would bring, and if some special presence would appear under the tree on Christmas morning. Times were hard and money was scarce. The factory where James had worked for 25 years had closed, and his wife, June, had a part-time job at a department store while the children were at play school. James was a skilled craftsman and did fix-up work around the town. Two days before Christmas, James remarked to his wife, June, It looks like there will be enough this year to buy gifts for the children and each other, in addition to the nice Christmas dinner that we planned. I know that Jimmy wants that air rifle that is in the window of Blackstone's hardware store more than anything else. Do you know what Jennifer wants? Yes, June replied. What Jennifer has her heart set on is that frilly princess dress on the mannequin at the store. It is expensive. Knowing that we were short of money, she dared not wish for it. But I have already started paying on it. What do you want? James asked his wife. It's cold, and I could really use a good scarf. That is little enough. Are you sure you want nothing else? No. I would rather the money go for the children's presents. Do you need anything, June asked? A new watch. Mine is broken, and I need to be able to know how long I took to do a job. Nothing fancy, just a good everyday timepiece. In the meantime, the usual preparations for the Christmas meal had begun. There would be a Christmas goose that was already in the freezer. It had been brought over by James's brother after a successful hunt. Even dressed, it was a nice bird that would provide ample goose and dressing for the family. There would also be rice, sweet potatoes, a favorite succotash made from corn and butter beans, potato salad, collard greens, rolls, and a salad featuring a pear half on lettuce. For dessert, family tradition dictated that this be an English plum pudding baked with an ancient three-penny coin that had been in the family for generations. Jimmy asked, Why do you put that in the pudding? His mother answered as she stirred the thick dough in a wooden bowl. On Christmas morning, the thruppence has magical powers. Whichever person has the card in his, has the coin in his slice, a pudding may make one wish. Only one? Jennifer questioned. Only one, Jimmy replied with all the great authority that his five years could muster. Otherwise, it would not be special. That's right, Mrs. J replied. Only one wish. And it is best if that Christmas wish is not for yourself, but for someone else. Just as the Christ child gave to the whole world, we should also give to others. That's no fun. Jennifer quickly responded with a small pout forming on her lips. If I have only one wish, I'm going to wish it on myself. A wish freely given is a double blessing. It blesses both the one that gives and the one that receives. To give freely without expectation of getting anything back is the highest expression of the Christmas spirit. It rewards both the giver and the recipient, Mother J explained. I won't give anything unless I get something back, Jennifer asserted as she left the room. She will know when she is older 
Mrs. J. said to Jimmy as he watched her knead the thick dough into a mold. Giving is always better. Any Tressa clothes go away. Come not in this house on Christmas Day. Jennifer repeated as she turned herself around and around to the left on the porch in the front of the door. Auntie Tressa Claus go away. Come not this house on Christmas Day. Auntie Tressa Claus go away. Come not this... Stop! Stop! Her father shouted as he walked up the snow-covered walk toward the house. That charm only works on Christmas morning at sunrise. If used at any other time, it attracts her rather than keeps her from coming. Do you know what happens if she comes? She takes the presents away, Jennifer responded somewhat fearfully. She has that power, but that is not all. Come in the house and I will tell you about her. Once inside, with hats, overshoes, and jackets removed, and now warming comfortably in front of the stove, the father called his two children to him. Sit down, and I will tell you about Auntie Tressa Claus. She is not to be trifled with or tempted to come to anyone's Christmas. Why? Jennifer asked. She takes all the presents away, Jimmy blurted out, eager to impress his sister with his profound knowledge. Jimmy, like most things in life, it is a bit more complicated than that, James explained. You know that at the North Pole there lives Santa Claus, his wife Mrs. Claus, and the elves who make the Christmas presents that Santa distributes to the world's children on Christmas Eve. Tomorrow night, Jimmy affirmed. Yes, tomorrow. Be quiet, Jimmy, and let me finish. Like all of the Clauses, Santa's sister, Auntie Tressa Claus, has magical powers. She can see what is inside Christmas presents, even if they are wrapped. This way, she makes sure that the presents go to the right girls and boys, and that the elves have addressed them correctly. Unlike the jolly old elf, Santa, who only wants to give, Auntie Tressa Claus wants to get, too. Each Christmas, she visits houses on Christmas morning, and she gives out the presents. If she finds one she likes, she keeps it for herself. If she is refused at the door, she has the power to take everybody's presents, even those for the little children. So if she comes, she must be treated as an honored guest, so that she will take only some presents and not all of them. All of them? The two children asked nearly simultaneously. Every, every one. And the Christmas dinner and decorations, too, James affirmed. Every, every one. If the Christmas charm is used too soon, it attracts her to come rather than keeps her away. Like a medicine, it must be applied in the right way at the right time. I'm sorry, Jennifer said as her eyes started to mist over what promised to be a good cry. It's probably all right. James assured Jennifer as he took his daughter in his arms. Auntie Tressa Claus only visits six houses every Christmas. Chances are, with so many having better Christmases than we, she will find better pickings elsewhere. A charm! A charm! A charm! A charm too soon! We'll be there before noon! Auntie Tressa Claus cackled at the North Pole as she inspected the final batches of presents before they were dispatched. The Jays can host me with our roast goose and dressing and pudding and presents, too. Especially, especially presents, too, she muttered as she directed the near frantic elves at their work. Of all the clauses, she was the worst to work for. Nothing could please her. The ribbons were too bright or too dull or too little or too large. Now the boxes were too big or too small, and nothing was ever done fast enough. She considered the hard-working elves lazy if they were not working at anything less than a super double-quick fast pace. She continuously urged them on, and it is little wonder that they made occasional mistakes that would raise her to a fury. 
It delighted her to think of ways to make them work ever faster and harder. Faster, faster, she would say as she walked through the workshops. Christmas comes. Don't be a laster. Laster was a made-up word that had become one of her favorites. She used it to designate some poor elf who, through accident, misfortune, a happenstance, happened to be the last one to finish his work. No matter how hard they worked, someone would finish last and receive antitrust clauses full fury and the designation of a lazy laster. She wore a cast-off red Santa cap and one of his old coats that was many sizes too large for her. This garment had been up and down several thousand chimneys too many. On her feet were the magic shoes that permitted her to rapidly move about their frigid, frozen kingdom at the North Pole and go from there to anywhere on earth. Tormenting the elves delighted her almost more than anything else. She seldom left the North Pole except for her annual visits to some unfortunate families on Christmas Day. As the Christmas sun rose across the earth, she would spend four hours with six families across the time zones before the Christmas Day finally set in the far-off islands of Alaska and in the Pacific Ocean. Of the six families, the Jays were number five on her list. The Honolulu Hockeys in warm and sunny Hawaii were the last. Her face was gaunt with several missing teeth. Her bony fingers were twisted. But these were still nimble enough to grab presents away from the children of the unfortunate families that she visited. The day before Christmas, the Jay's house was full of the smells of roasting goose, cooking sweet potatoes, and baking breads. So much as possible, the Christmas dinner was made the day before. The children enjoyed helping their mother in the kitchen. Jimmy was busy cracking and picking out pecans while Jennifer was stuffing dates with pecan halves and rolling them in powdered sugar. Two hours before, the goose had been salted and put in a big black pan for roasting. It was now beginning to emit a delicious aroma. I could eat a whole goose, Jimmy asserted, but I like the dressing best of all. Already the onions and celery had been cut up for the dressing. The egg bread and hoe cake had been crumbled into a large brown bowl. I won't cook the dressing until Christmas morning, because I need the drippings from the goose to finish it off, June informed her son as he tried to sneak a stuffed date off his sister's plate. That's for Christmas, Jennifer scolded. If we ate them now, we won't have any. Why do we have to wait? Why can't we have these all the time, Jimmy asked. Memories are best kept as family traditions, the mother explained. I cooked the Christmas meal just as my mother did, and her mother before that. In the foods we cook, it is almost as if in making them, we had our whole family back again. Each generation adds its own little touches to the meal. When you kids have families, you will invent your own things to add. Why aren't we having turkey then again this year? Jimmy responded, quick to point out this obvious change from past Christmas meals. Because your Uncle Jim, who you are named for, was fortunate enough to take some geese while he was hunting. He gave us this fat goose for our dinner. I want to hunt too, Jimmy said. You will, June responded. James and Jim will take you when you are old enough. In the meantime, you have to learn to shoot. Handle a gun safely, be quiet in the woods, and about the animals you're going to hunt. That's why I want a BB gun, Jimmy said. Will I get one this year? We'll see, his mother replied. I don't see why you want to get all cold and dirty and hunt and shift things, Jennifer stated. I want to be beautiful like mother and stay indoors where it's warm. That's all right, too, the mother replied as she measured four tablespoons of rum to mix with the sugar for the rum butter sauce that would go over the plum pudding. Girls can hunt, too. I did, and sometimes went with your father before you were born. James laid out two $10 bills, three $1 bills, a half dollar, 
a dime, and four pennies on the counter at Blackstone's Hardware to pay the $23.64 for the Daisy Red Rider air rifle. It came in a cardboard box with a clear cellophane window so that the blued steel and wooden stock were visible. Merry Christmas, the young clerk shouted back after he had handed the newly wrapped presents to, its, to his customer. James hurriedly left the store so that he could walk down the street to the department store to pick up the presents that his wife had been paying on and to select a scarf for his wife. The young lady behind the counter was out of school and making some money working part-time during the Christmas season. I will take that warm-looking wool one there, James said as he pointed out a scarf having a green and red plaid. He then went back to the layaway desk to collect the rest of his presents. With your wife's employee discount, that is $14.56 to clear out the layaway account and for the scarf, the older man behind the counter said as he looked up from his ledger. James counted out the money. The man got off his stool and went to a rear room. He picked up the big box that contained Jennifer's present and a small box that James knew held the watch that his wife had selected for him. Merry Christmas, the elder gentleman stated as he repositioned himself on his stool. As James turned to go with his stack of four cheerfully wrapped presents, he responded with a cheerful, Merry Christmas to you too! He felt good that although times were hard, the Jay family would indeed have a Merry Christmas. Christmas morning brought the quiet hush of a new blanket of snow, and snowflakes dancing on a cold wind from the North Pole glinted under the street lights on the corner. Jimmy woke under a thick layer of blankets. He stuck one hand out and quickly pulled it back. He listened, and he could hear the satisfying sound of his father pouring a fresh scupper of coal into the big pot-bellied stove in the middle of the living room. Soon the house would warm up and he could go down. On a chair beside the bed was a heavy house coat and the bedroom slippers that he had been given last year. His plan was to put these on quickly, run down the stairs, and stand by the stove. The damper clanked in the stovepipe, and now, even through the door, he could hear the satisfying roar emitted by the stove as the new load of coal was catching fire. Bracing himself against the shock of warm feet hitting a cold wood floor, he threw himself out of bed, turned the, the table lamp on, shivered as he felt the cold bathrobe through his flannel pajamas, and stuffed his feet into the bedroom shoes. He prepared to run down the stairs to make sure that his present was still under the tree. He thought he knew what it was. He was almost sure that his air rifle was in that box. But the anticipation was nearly as delicious as a finding out. Flinging open his room door, he almost slammed it behind him. But catching himself, he halted it, closed the door quietly, and stood on the landing. Two conflicting needs arose and intensified now that he was exposed to the cold. The bathroom door between his and his sister's room was open, and he could take care of that and then go down to greet Christmas Day. Jennifer, awakened by the loud flushing noise of the commode in the next door bathroom, opened her eyes to see that her room was still dark. Christmas! It's Christmas come! She said as she threw back her covers and instantly drew them back over her when the wedge of cold air replaced the cocoon of warmth that her body had generated beneath her pile of wool blankets. It's cold. Grr, she said. Then the door opened and Jimmy turned on the light. Merry Christmas, he said. Daddy started the stove and it will be warm downstairs. Where are your slippers and rub? Closet. I'll get some for you. Hurry. Maybe we can open presents. Knowing that no presents could be opened until the entire family was assembled, Jimmy closed the door and went to the stair landing, which was lit by the light coming up from the downstairs rooms. Going down the tread, step by step, he peered deeper and deeper into the rooms below him to make sure that everything was still there from the night before. The stove was now beginning to glow red at the top. The Christmas tree was still in the corner, 
and its lights had been turned back on. The four boxes were under the tree. He could hear his mother and dad in the kitchen and smell the aroma of coffee and frying sausage. Christmas Day would very, very soon come. Santa didn't bring us anything, Jennifer observed, as she looked carefully under the tree and saw only the four presents that had been there the night before. Oh, yes, he did, her father said, gathering one and then the other of his two children in his arms and squeezing them tightly to his chest. He brought us each other on this fine Christmas day. Even through the heavy robes, the children felt the warmth of their father's body and the accustomed smell of the scented shaving soap that he had used that morning. There is no present any better than this, James continued. Now let's have some breakfast. As they turned to go to the breakfast table, a loud, rapid knocking was heard from the front door. Who could that be this early on Christmas Day? June asked. We often have friends drop by in the afternoon, but not the first thing in the morning. Unsaid in the back of her mind was, something must be terribly, terribly wrong for anyone to come this early on Christmas morn. James, see who that could be. James released his children and turned to go to the door. Before he could arrive, there was another fury of knocking that was even more insistent. <laughs> Through the window of his own house, he could see that the lights of the Christmas tree had already been turned on. The holiday wreath abounded almost joyfully on the front door as he opened and closed it. He burst in with his packages and was instantly tugged upon by two pairs of eager hands. Wait, wait, James said. These go under the tree. They don't get opened until Christmas morning. Reluctantly, the children released their father and he carefully placed the four presents under the tree. There was one large box, one long slim box, a smaller long slim box, and a tiny one. At this stage, there were no names on any of the presents. Mine's this one, Jimmy said, as he grabbed the longest one and gave it an exploratory shake. This shake was followed by the satisfying thump, thump, as something heavy rattled inside. This one's mine, Jennifer shouted, picking up the largest box and stroking the brightly printed wrappings. Maybe so. And maybe not, James stated. You will have to wait until tomorrow to find out. Come in, come in, James said to his early morning visitor as he unlocked and opened the door. It is good that you welcome me so, said the strange appearing visitor. From what could be seen at a glance, this red cloaked figure surrounded by blowing snow looked indeed like it had just come from the North Pole. Clothed from head to feet in a worn and soot-stained red coat many times too large for her, the slim old lady raised a white bony hand and pointed it at James. Snow fell from the white trim cuffs on the sleeves and the trim of her cap, which was pulled down over her ears. I am Tressa Claus. The last family did not welcome me, and they did not like the result, she cackled. I kept our Christmases away. June, children, Auntie Tressa Claus is here. Set another place at the table. She will be our honored guest this Christmas Day. While he said so, he cast a pained look at his wife. He had to keep up a pleasant appearance for the benefit of his newly arrived guest. And these must be the children. Sweet little angels that they are, you probably don't have to spank them more than twice a day. Once a day if they needed a knot, Annie Tressa Claus remarked as she cast a chilling glance at Jimmy and Jennifer. We love our children, James said in a quick reply. And no, we don't have to spank them every day, almost never. They're good kids. I'm very, very sure, Tressa Claus responded. Very, very, very sure indeed, she added in a disparaging tone. 
Another place was quickly set at the breakfast table for their new guest. From the family Bible, James withdrew a tattered sheet of paper. It contained some lines that were written with a quill pen in an antique flowing style once known as copperplate. The ink was still dark on the browning paper. This is our family Christmas prayer, James said before he started to read. With this announcement, everyone took their seats. James was at the head of the table. Jimmy sat to his left, Jennifer to his right. Then June and Auntie Tressa Claus sat at the foot. A vacant place was set between Auntie Tressa Claus and Jennifer in honor of family members who had shared in the celebrations of previous Christmases but were now dead. Heavenly Father, in remembrance of the child Jesus that you gave to save the world from sin, let us celebrate this day in honor of his birth. Bring peace and your blessings to those gathered here. This family, wherever they may be, and to the world. Amen. All, including Tressa Claus, joined in the Amen. The remainder of breakfast passed in a rather strained silence, broken only by Auntie Tressa Claus's noisy complaints that the plates were too cold, the grits were not salty enough, the sausage ill-seasoned, and the coffee was too weak. It's time to give out presents, Annie Tressa Claus announced after she had finished eating. An involuntary, that is the bestest time, escaped from Jennifer's lips before she thought exactly who that Christmas guest was and what she could do. Maybe so, and maybe, maybe not, Tressa Claus replied. Sitting on a blue cloth-covered stool under the Christmas tree, Tressa Claus restacked the four presents in a pile. The largest box was on the bottom and the smallest on top. I would be pleased if you would take this one, James said, as he lifted the smallest box off the pile that contained the watch that June had brought for him. I have no native time, Tressa Claus replied sourly as he handed the box back to James. You open it. He opened it and saw that it was a wrist watch with a leather band and a golden cover hands and numbers. Showing it to Tressa Claus, James asked with a hint of pleading slipping into his voice, Are you sure you don't want this? No, 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 not that one. There are others, Tressa Claus replied with an evil grin spreading across her face. Perhaps you would like this one then, June said as she handed her the next box off the stack. No, 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 no. Not that one either. I have no need of things to keep me from the call. With this, she jabbed June's hands with a frigid finger, and June jumped from the touch. Next down the stack was a long, thin box. Jimmy closed his eyes and crossed his fingers behind his back in hopes that Tressa Claus would not want so boyish a present. Tears swelled up behind his eyes when he heard Tressa Claus's cries of cackling pleasure as she visualized the contents. A daisy red rider air rifle, she gleefully said. This is just what I need to motivate those lazy elves. A pop in the butt with this will keep them moving. Jimmy, don't you think I should have this? Do you give it freely? Answer me, boy. Annie Tressa Claus would ask in rapid fire fashion. So filled with disappointment as to be almost unable to speak, Jimmy replied with a nearly whispered, Yes. He then went up to the bathroom to get a towel to dry his tears. Jennifer sat expectantly. The last, biggest, and bestest present on the bottom of the pile was obviously hers. Surely, she thought, Tressa Claus would have no use for a little girl's dress with his white lace, pink ruffles, and bright red bows. Hey, that's rather nicely, comment from Tressa Claus dashed her hopes. I will make those lazy lasters wear it, and they will be so embarrassed as to redouble their efforts. Do you freely give this to your dear old Auntie Tressa Claus, she asked. 
A stammered yes escaped Jennifer's lips as she fought back tears. I must go soon to call on the Honolulu hockey family in Hawaii, but I would like a little Christmas pudding before I go. I've already eaten three Christmas dinners, and I'm getting a little stuffed. A little pudding and rum sauce would be just the thing to finish up. Eager to do anything to have their Christmas guests leave as quickly as possible, James and June removed the breakfast dishes from the table, put them beside the sink, and June put a small pot on the stove to warm the rum, butter, sugar sauce that would go on top. The small pudding was a molded dome with fluted sides and a star on top. The rum sugar sauce had been heated to the point where it could be ladled on top of the cold pudding. It would quickly harden into a crust and change the pudding's color from dark brown to snow white when the sugary glaze hardened. Small plates were set, and soon everyone was around the table. The custom was that the pudding be cut into as many pieces as there were guests. Everyone could eat as much of the rich pudding as was wanted. The rest of their slices were wrapped in tinfoil, labeled, and put in the bread box to be eaten before New Year's Day, when all of the Christmas decorations were to be put away. Taking care to cut five exactly equal slices, James placed them on small china plates. He was hoping that he would get the silver thruppets, but that was not to be. Wherever the small silver coin was, it was not exposed when he sliced the pudding. The first slice was given to their honored guest, and before the others received theirs, Tressa Claus started eating. The next slice went to his wife, June, the next to Jimmy, the one following that to Jennifer, and the last was reserved for himself. When the plates were distributed, James nodded his head in a sign that the children could start eating. Nothing was heard but the soft clank of forks against the china plates. I found it! I found it! I found it! Jennifer excitedly exclaimed as she held up the small shiny silver coin with the bust of a king. It was old and worn. The funny-looking rotund bust of the former king in his wig tickled her, and she twittered with a soft laughter. Jennifer, you have one wish. Think about it hard before you wish it. Father James counseled in what he hoped sounded like an offhand remark. He knew very well that there was only one wish that could undo all that had transpired that Christmas morning and make everything right again. Jennifer grasped the coin tightly in her hands, closed her eyes, and her face distorted as she thought about possible wishes and their consequences. Hurry up, child. I have to go. Wish quickly and wish well. Both good and bad can come from wishing, Tressa Claus admonished with a threatening cackle. I wish. I wish. I wish that when Jennifer reopened her eyes, she was once more on the stoop in front of the house door, and her father was walking down the snow-covered walk. She ran to him threw her arms around his legs, and hugged him. Surprised, James uttered a startled, What's all this? Oh, Danny, I wished. I wished. I wished. Jennifer stammered with tears of joy running down her face. Annie Tressa Claus will not come. She won't. Releasing her father's leg, she opened the door, and they went inside to participate in the family's preparations for a joyous J. Family Christmas. Come here, children, and I will tell you all about antitrust accounts. If you did not have a chance to sponsor a visit from antitrust accounts during the pledge period from March the 1st through February the 3rd and still wish to fund some of my projects, you can go to my website, www.hobysmith.com. And there you'll find a PayPal button where you may donate. You'll find my books, blogs, videos, and also learn about my radio show, Hobie's Outdoor Adventures. Thanks and God bless.